And I love whitetail water holes. Uh, I think I might have 30 videos about water holes, 25, 30, 35, whatever it is, in, in a playlist uh, on YouTube. So you can check those out. But there's an overall whitetail water hole sin that I see used with water holes. And let's look at water holes for what they are. They're not something that, and except for maybe the arid Southwest, where you can actually put water on your land and attract animals from a great distance. That doesn't happen in the north half of the country in most locations, no matter how hot it gets or dry, because deer process most of their moisture and their, their uh, liquid requirements, the daily water that they need from plants that they eat. They don't need to actually hit water, water holes for weeks at a time. We see the use really pick up actually when it gets cold during the rut because the bucks are moving greatly. They're pushing does. They're expending a lot of energy. And just like us, if you're a runner, a biker, oh boy, I can remember playing hockey out on the ice. It's 10 degrees, we're in t-shirts and sweating like little kids do, teenagers, and, and we couldn't wait to get something to drink. It doesn't matter if it's cold, you still get thirsty because of your physical activity, and that's why we see the water hole use pick up. But there is a number one water hole sin out there, and that is a water hole, again, is not something that attracts more deer to your land. It helps define movement. So deer are already here. We're using a water hole and a mock scrape, both of them, sometimes in combination, but when it comes to a water hole, we're actually using that to define movement. So what that means is, and as it relates to number one sin, is if you have a water hole and you don't have a stand location over it, then you're doing yourself a great disservice because if you can't shoot this water hole, no matter how good it is, with a bow, and you're a bow hunter, even a gun hunter, just to have a water hole on your land doesn't do anything. You have to be able to have a stand and look at it. Now I could go into a few other things. For example, this water hole right here is on my own land in Minnesota, and I'm not, I'm not a real fan of it. For one, it's tucked down in here in a hole. So a deer that's in here, has to go up on the bank to see over it. Deer in general, especially the further north you go when you have predators, they don't want these big berms around a water hole where they're standing right here and they can't see six feet on the other side for some type of predator that's sneaking up on them. And instinctually, they don't like being down in a pit like this. Now in the summer, there's no pressure. Deer are using this, you know, that's great. There's a lot of deer tracks around here, but it's not like beat down or these weeds wouldn't be growing around this water right here. It'd be beat down enough to where they're at. And I could even say there's a trail that comes through right here and it goes up and those deer aren't necessarily going to the water hole. They're just getting up into this field. There's a trail right here that's really heavy that goes up and that one just cuts the corner and goes over this trail right here. Regardless though, there's a lot of mud here. This mud helps propagate the EHD midge by drying and cracking in the late summer. We don't, we don't have a lot of water. That midge lives in here and that's what promotes the EHD on a property. So this is an EHD outbreak waiting to happen in my, in my view and from my experience. So I like the water tubs. What's nice about a water tub is it's going to be one tenth the size, maybe 5% of this size. We're gonna put in a 110, 105 gallon tank and with that tank, there's no mud around it or very little. We actually plant clover and grasses around it at times, but most of the time there's just no mud. You don't have that drying receding mud that helps promote the HD midge and kill deer. Water holes in a tank is a lot different. So I like the smaller size. I like the fact that you can promote something, a tank doesn't have this mud to help, mud to help spread the uh, EHD virus. And, uh, and then I also like a water hole that's more in a location where deer that are drinking that water can see and they feel safe. But bottom line is, no matter what you do, again, the number one white tail water hole sin that I see is having a water hole in a location where you can't shoot the deer that come into that water. It's doing yourself a disservice, it's actually pulling deer away from your stand position. And I'll mention one more, you don't want a water hole on the food plot, they're already coming to the food plot. Now there's an exception, you have little small hunting plots where deer are just passing through, but if that little small hunting plot is attractive enough without the water, you're always better putting the water somewhere else. So you develop two stand locations, one on the way to the water, one on the or food, or water one on the way back, vice versa. This is a location right here where we have some decent trees for stands around here. But once we get into this location down here, there's deer bedding. 
I don't want to walk into here. Our food plot's right up here. We can get up into a stand location up on top over there. It's about 60 yards away, blow our scent off. Maybe a post daybreak stand location. We can get over this way about 100 yards and just tuck in behind some switchgrass, get into that edge. That's a potential good stand location. There's a stand location about 150 yards over there. But once we get back into this food plot location here, into this back corner, we can't come in and out of here without spooking deer. The food plot is right here. It is big, it's about two acres. You can see the top of the redneck maybe all the way back there. So we have our redneck blind all the way at the back of the food plot back there. And we can get in and out of that. In fact, we had corn in front of it last year. We have switchgrass growing there. This year, it'll be probably four feet tall. We have a hedgerow. So with just even the hedgerow alone and the lay of the road, it, it actually goes downhill past the redneck. So we can get in and out of that redneck, not spook a lot of deer out of here, but we can't really get across this food plot and get into a stand position that takes advantage of this water. And that's why this water has to go. We have another location that had a pit like this in a wrong spot. We tried to utilize it a little bit last year, but the sightings just weren't there. Again, going back to, for one, we didn't have a stand location otherwise there because it wasn't a great spot. And so we're taking a great movement, maybe rut cruising between uh, bedding areas, a location between bedding and food. We're looking at that location, so we can kill bucks here. Let's make it better by adding a water hole. These are the type of places where good spot for a water hole, bad spot for a stand location. You never let, let the location for a good water hole or a spot where you can actually get water to settle in here and actually be present determine if it's a good stand location or not. We would have to force this. We tried to force it on that other one. Luckily, the other one eroded out and it's dry. And that's actually a good thing. This one, we're gonna have to take a shovel or a skid steer, push out the back of that and let it drain out. And we'll probably plant it in something so it holds the soil. But bottom line is, really bad spot. We don't have a stand location nearby. And that's a number one sin because I see on properties where there's an exceptional water hole use, but it's 80 yards away from a bow stand, a couple bow stands, and it's literally pulling deer away from those stand locations, making those stand locations less valuable because they're heading to that water hole. Who cares if they're hitting it every day and you have a camera on it, if you can't hunt it, you just did yourself a major disservice. I hope that makes a little sense. Look at finding a great movement that is dry, between dry bedding areas, dry bedding area on the way to an afternoon food source. Those are always great spots. There are areas that force a deer to go the opposite direction of where you want them to go to hit water on the neighbor's land. And a lot of times when deer head that direction, they don't change the direction back and go back the opposite direction after they hit that water. So if you have water on the way to food, if you have water in between bedding areas, you're not gonna attract more deer to land, but you are going to define movement, put a stand location right over it, Avoid that major water hole sin by just sticking water on in your land, thinking that's a good thing. That's why a lot of times I like dry properties better than properties that have creeks and streams. The creeks and streams are great uh, swamps because they dictate that there's going to be a diversity of habitat. And diversity is always great. You're going to have edge. But when it comes to water, not having water is often better because, again, you're not putting more deer on your land. You're just creating a great stand location. You're making a good stand location better don't try to force it and say kind of like food plots just because you have great soil in a location an open field doesn't mean you should be planting a food plot there just because you love white pines white cedar red cedar to stick a stand in doesn't mean you just go stick a stand in that location because it's the best tree on the property you always find the deer movement enhance the deer movement find it on public land stick a stand location on it where you can actually shoot to that movement and you'll be far better off, especially with a lot of your water hole efforts, if you're putting them in the right spot to begin with, getting a bow stand over it and enjoying the hunting season. I'm excited to tell you guys about my latest web class. It's how to plant food plots, how to design your food plot program, and it covers everything. And really there's 30 videos, over 10 hours, 11 hours of footage, workbook hats, you know, all that stuff on top of it. I urge you to check out the link, but I cover five main areas critical food plot concepts, where to plant, how to create, what to plant, and finally how to plant. It takes you through that step by step so you can make your own decisions that apply to you and build a great high quality food plot program 
this year, whether you have decades of experience or no experience at all.